What would it take for your parents to believe that your childhood friend is actually a ghost? Would growing up in a haunted house lead you to fear entities from the other side? Or would you go chasing after them, even voluntarily sleep in the same rooms as them? Today's guest is an artisan, a podcaster, and a ghost hunter, and her thirst for knowledge of the unseen began when a little ghost girl started braiding her hair. Let's talk with Angela today on Homespun Haints. Hello, Hainted Loves. Welcome to Homespun Haints. I'm Becky. I'm Diana. And today on the show, we are so thrilled to have a lady that we met in person a couple weeks ago at Midsummer Scream in Long Beach, California. It is Angela Hartshorn of Heart and Horn and My Haunted Life podcast. And as you can probably gather, she has a haunted life. Hey, there's a reason it's called that. She has a lot of ghost stories to share. She makes these beautiful, elaborate witch hats that you can buy. She sews them herself, makes these really, really cool laser cut leather hair ties and things like that. She's got some really cool stuff. But also, she's got ghost stories, which is why we have her on the show. Haunted Haberdasher, our first. And she's also going to tell you a little bit about the haunted boat that Diana and I stayed on, which is really cool. Who don't love a haunted boat? Before we bring her on, though, I had a really interesting story that came across my inbox. Do tell. There's this place in the Himalayas, which I know some people pronounce Himalayas, but I've been corrected so many times that I'm going to pronounce it the way people who live there tell me to pronounce it, which is Himalayas. There's this place called Skeleton Lake. Nice. <laughs> it's called Skeleton Lake because it's full of skeletons. Oh, wow. <laughs> Why is this lake full of skeletons, back? <laughs> Sometimes having a lake full of skeletons could be a bad thing. Maybe. It's called Rupkund Lake. It is a frozen lake, but there's all of these skeletons that are like stacked next to it. <laughs> oh, 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 stacked skeletons? <laughs> well, maybe they pulled them out to study. I don't know. Oh. And then carefully folded them and put them back in the drawer (laughs) and left (laughs) time traveling archaeologists so it's 4800 meters up it is permanently frozen yeah the bones were discovered in 1942 and they estimated and this is kind of a wide range between 300 and 800 people that is a wide range this is pretty high up this is like a really really weird place to have 800 bodies (laughs) is this near a city or a village where people lived it's out in the middle of nowhere out in the middle of nowhere like you're climbing the himalayas you know, this is the same mountain range that has Mount Everest in it. This is this is pretty high up. I have a theory. <laughs> I have a theory. As usual. <laughs> I'll tell you what the theories are of the people who have studied the bones, and you can tell me your own theories. So this has been around a while. It's not new news. What is new is some recent DNA studies that they have done on the bones. They've known about this for 80 years. It was about 10 years, actually more like 15 years before they actually revealed this to the public. People are going to ask questions when you find a lake full of 300 to 800 skeletons. Yeah. And yes. these are all human skeletons just to be. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Specific. Yeah. It's not. And when, it's not when like they date these skeletons, are they modern skeletons or were they at the time or well, were they ancient skeletons? So they thought they were ancient. <laughs> oh, they got some explaining to do. What's what? <laughs> First of all, this happens to be below this really, really high ridge, Junar Gali, which has like this beautiful view of the mountains and the glaciers and things like that. So people who are going to be trying to hike it, they would like want to get up to this view to see the landscape, right? And mm-hmm. the lake is just below it, like it's very cliff steep. Face. Yeah. There's that joke like, oh, maybe they just all fell off the ridge. Maybe that's where they came from. If everybody else jumped off the cliff, would you too? (laughs) Uh Apparently everybody did one day. When they were first discovered, they thought, oh, okay, these are people who were walking the Silk Road way back in the 1200s. Oh, wow. It's so cold up there. Mm -hmm. These bones look like they could have been only 100 years old. 
everything's like preserved, right? It's frozen. Yeah. They, yeah, they haven't frozen. decayed in any way. They haven't right. sun bleached. They haven't dried out because they're frozen in ice. Bones can decay. I've held decaying bones. Mm -hmm. If the soil's really acidic for one, it can like eat away at the bone. They thought that they were hiking the Silk Road and there was some sort of epidemic or they just didn't dress right and they all died. Just happened to all die right there. 800 They just happened to all die. Just happened to die. Yeah. <laughs> 800 people were walking down a road. They died. Yeah. I don't know. Sober. That might be an indefensible argument. Okay. So then they did some forensic analysis about 20 years ago, and they thought that it was a group of pilgrims, Hindu pilgrims, on a pilgrimage. Making a pilgrimage to where? This place called Homkund. The pilgrimage itself is called the Nanda Devi Raj Yat Yatra. I'm sorry. I'm really badly pronouncing these words. It's a very sacred every 12 year pilgrimage. And they believe that this was ninth century pilgrims. So over a 1000 years ago, walking through and they got hit by a giant hailstorm. Oh, so they all died quite suddenly from freezing. And then they were preserved in the frozen freezing hail. No, they think that they just like got struck with really large hail balls on their heads and died. Oh, <laughs> So that was 2004 when they're like, oh, they're just pilgrims, ninth century pilgrims, got hit by giant hail, died. Fair. Which seems like a really far out theory, but they were <laughs> like, it's both men and women and they don't look like soldiers and they all died at once. So Children or no children? They didn't say anything about children. It wasn't yeah. like a traveling band of nomads who were moving from one location to another. They would have brought the kids. Right. So in 2019, they did some DNA analysis because they now sequenced the genome. You remember back before we knew that they had the genome sequence? <laughs> oh, those were the days before we had genome sequencing. We could just be ignorant about everything. Tell me what the genome says. I think. Okay, so this is a buildup of skeletons over a thousand year period. <gasps> so there was no mass death at there this was lake. No death. It's just a place where people just happen to die. Right? A lot. Yeah. In the lake. So there was a South Asian group, which makes sense, right? That they think between year 600 and 900, they just kind of died there. Maybe they were just passing through. But they were probably from the surrounding area in India going through. Maybe mm -hmm. they were trying to make ice cream. I don't know. But they were up there. And <laughs> then there were a group of people from Crete, which is... A Greek island. Yeah, that's far away. They were probably going down the Silk Road, weren't they? In the 1800s. Oh, that's pretty recent. They were from the 1800s. Yes. And then a group of more people from India, Pakistan region, also from the 1800s. <laughs> So you had a bunch of people 100 years ago that are, are trekking through. I have my own theory, but I want to know what you think, Diana. So you have a thousand year span. You do have some people who they may have been on a pilgrimage, but then you've got people from Greece <laughs> in the 1800s going through. What do you think's going on? I think what happened mm -hmm. was you said this is about 5,000 meters up the mountain. Is that right? Yeah, it's 4,800 meters. So that's nowhere near the top of this mountain, as we know, because there's a sheer cliff that goes up next to it, right? It goes up another 200 meters. So what I think happened was people have been passing away on this mountain, all over the mountain. But because of the shape of the mountain, maybe when it snows, deep, deep, deep snow people's corpses that have passed away on this mountain get caught up in the snow and as the snow melts they all fall off this cliff into this lake oh that actually makes a lot of sense so the people didn't all die in the lake they just all fell into the lake eventually through snowfall and snow melt does the mm -hmm. snow ever melt in the area though that's a really important question no but there might be avalanches and things ah that would see, cause the snow see to... yeah so, so yeah. as long as this is not at the top of the mountain and as long as people make pilgrimages up this mountain, I think that's a reasonable theory, no? I like it. That the snow may I... have formed and melted, formed and melted enough to get all the people that died on this mountain washed into this lake. That makes a lot more sense than my theory. Ooh, what's your theory? My theory is that sometime in the 1800s, a group of explorers found this pile of bones and were trying to figure out what it was. So they reached out to their colleagues in Crete to come up and explore it. And they had a whole science team up there of hundreds of individuals studying these bones. 
But then there was a massive hailstorm and they all died. And not <laughs> only to be discovered a hundred years later. You like the hailstorm theory. <laughs> I mean, it's so bizarre. <laughs> it is a bizarre theory. Like, how do you die from a hailstorm? Apparently there were impacts on some of the heads. <gasps> oh. So they're like, oh, they must have gotten hit by hail. No, but no, I mean, you can tell the difference between a postmortem and a premortem impact wound on a skeleton, right? I can't, but I'm sure other people. Well, can. no, not you. No, wrong kind of archaeology. You're a forensic <laughs> archaeologist, right? That's so not what I do. Somebody who is a specialist in both archaeology and forensics could probably determine if this was made before or after death. In which case, I'm going to still argue that in an avalanche, you're going to get some impact wounds on your skeleton, even if you're just a corpse. I still like my theory that it was a 19th century <laughs> set of explorers day. trying to figure out what killed these people and they ended up dying themselves. <laughs> the archaeologists become <laughs> the studied corpses. Which should be a warning for all of those that are going up this mountain to study them yourself. You might be like the last group and then get buried and discovered again in 2142. And they'd be like, oh. what are all these skeletons? They must be 10th century pilgrims. And they'd be like, wait, some of them are 21st century. This doesn't make any sense. <laughs> I do like that theory. I love it. Well, anyway, if you happen to be venturing through the Himalayas and you come to Rupkund Lake, you too can look at the piles of bodies. But be careful because it's the circle <laughs> of archaeology. <laughs> <laughs> you will soon become one of those bodies. <laughs> Watch out for hailstorms. <laughs> it's really important. Wear proper footwear. Oh, so proper. Put snow tires. And cover your nose. So warm. Maybe your eyes too. Wear a hard hat. Because your snot will free. People don't think about hard hats in the mountains. It's an important accessory. Anyway, we do have a patron to give a shout out to. Woohoo! I'm just so excited. You guys are really coming through for us. I think we just might make this goal of 100 patrons by September 1st. Oh we gosh. have 20 days left. <laughs> so <laughs> so oh, appreciate on, guys. it, you guys. So Alyssa, thank you so much for joining our Patreon. You are getting us one step closer. Thank we you, Alyssa. Appreciate it so much. Thank you again to last week's guest, Jennifer, who is also a patron. And we've also had other patrons on this show. So if you're a patron and you have a ghost story, don't hesitate to reach out to us and let us know. Yeah. You get fast tracked to getting on the show. <laughs> all our patrons get not only all our episodes commercial free, but then they also get to hear all of the stuff that's a little too skanky to air on, skanky. <laughs> no. on the regular airwaves. And if you're not a patron or a dead 18th century archaeologist in a lake, enjoy this commercial. Today on the show, we are thrilled to have Angela Hartshorn. She is the owner of Heart and Horn and also the producer of My Haunted Life podcast. So Hi. a very spooky lady. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Angela, thanks so much for being here. We're excited that you're here. I'm so excited to finally figure this out with you guys. I don't know how we kept missing each other. All three of us were in Long Beach, California, very recently for Midsummer Scream. And Diana and I stayed on the Queen Mary, which is a haunted boat yeah. that is permanently docked there. And we stayed there during the convention. And then Angela went there right afterwards yes. and got to do some cool things. It was perfect. You guys walked into my booth at Midsummer Scream. I saw your sign above your booth and I was like, a magnet. I was like, I need to actually talk to her face to face. <laughs> Not only that, but Amber, my Amber was like, come look at these amazing hair clips. This is the first time in 20 years I've wished I had long hair. Aww. So <laughs> led me straight to your booth. I'm like, wait a minute. This is familiar. <laughs> your inventory is gorgeous. Thank you. Tell us a little bit about Heart and Horn. So Heart and Horn is kind of my baby. It's what I do full time now. I do basically what I call wearable art and witchery. The hair slides are all my designs. And then the technological husband can digitize the files and they're all laser cut leather and everything's hand painted <gasps> and dyed. Everything is handmade. Like all the poppets are from the inside of the hats. 
scraps. Everything is reused. I keep myself fairly busy. And right now it's spooky season. So everything is witch hats for the most part. So people can order online from you, correct? Yes. At heartandhornstore.com. I try really hard to do them online. I'm not the best with show season because I think I have a show every two to three weeks for the rest <laughs> of... The rest of your life. Yeah, basically. <laughs> at least through October at this point. It's going to be a long fall for sure. But yay! Oh, yeah. Luckily, I love doing it. So are you a seamstress then? Yes. Wow, that is amazing. So everything start to finish. I did have a background in fashion design for a long time. And I started doing the hats because I worked at the Renaissance Festival for a bit. And we couldn't find good witch hats, so I started making witch hats for the booth. And then COVID happened, so fashion shows were gone completely and hats just took over my life. They are beautiful. They Aww. are so unique. They're gorgeous. Thank you. I had a lot of fun with them and the big thing I also got to add into it was the witchery part of it because I've been a practicing witch for now 20 plus years and now I get to share that with people because during COVID everyone wanted to know about witch stuff. Hell yeah. yeah. That was a big thing <laughs> so it's like that's my fun part of it. Oh wait wait I have to chase that theory for uh -oh. just a second. What do you mean in COVID everyone wanted to know about witch stuff? Everybody, it exploded. And I think it was because people had more time to really focus on themselves and really turn internally. And that's when we're, let's be honest, the political climate was not the greatest at the time. So a lot of witchcraft is about empowerment and everything, especially for women and of alternative lifestyles and communities and the LGBTQ folks and everything. Witchcraft really lends that self to them. I think a lot of people moved away from church stuff because they couldn't go to church that much anymore. Also, I wonder if it had something to do with the fact that a lot of people were really worried about their health, health care, mm -hmm. being able to, and I mean, not in any way advocating to use witchcraft when you should see a doctor. No. But I think there was definitely this sort of, like you said, self-care and like, what mm -hmm. can I do? What tea should I be drinking? Exactly. That will help me stay healthy or things like that. It's like a good helper. It's not the end all be all, but it's a good helper with things kind of thing. I know I've definitely been drinking a lot more ginger and turmeric oh, yeah. since COVID. <laughs> Most definitely. Things I would have never considered before. That's interesting. I don't think we've explored that yet, but that makes complete sense. And you're in it, in the e-commerce side of things. So you definitely would have seen it. Yeah, which is really yeah. weird to say. <laughs> like, oh, I'm a professional witch, <laughs> which is funny. My best friend, Andrew, he owns an oddity shop. I should plug him because I'll never hear the end of it. Cronk Art and Curiosities, downtown Colorado Springs. Uh -huh. I'm the house witch there. I do classes and stuff over there because there's definitely more people interested in learning right now. And it's really, I think it's really cool. It's fun to see. The moment you said that, the first thought I had was just like, oh, that makes sense that in times of ignorance, when we all feel ignorant together, magic gets a lot sexier. Yeah. Ooh, I like that. T-shirt. That's good. That's really good. <laughs> In times of collective ignorance, magic gets sexier. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> Go for it. So switching gears, tell us about My Haunted Life. My Haunted Life started as a COVID project. I'm a very big history nerd. That's my background. I actually went to school to be a high school history teacher and still in debt to it. So that's fun. I never did anything with it other than sub, which is funny. I just, I like the research i like the digging and that's the part i love that's the part i love finding things it made me do something during covid that i actually enjoyed doing that wasn't work so tell us about the podcast then what do you cover i know it's ghostly yeah it's mostly ghosty stuff i ironically just had a cryptid on because i just started the third season the whole month of august is campfire stories stories you should listen to around the campfire kind of thing and today was released it was pine barren so we go into the different ghosts that are out there and there's apparently a huge plethora of them and then of course we have to go into the jersey devil nice i had way too much fun mm -hmm. with that so you are haunted. You've <laughs> <laughs> you have some stories to share with us, which yes. is why you're here. Mm. I do want to get to the Queen Mary because I know yes. we were both on it very recently. But I also want to have you kind of go back in time oh, and God. think about one of the first spooky encounters that you had that you would like to share with us. The very first ghostly experience I had, I don't remember. My parents and me 
I was like two or three. Just moved into a new place. My mom was pregnant with my little brother kind of thing. And you know, children are children and they have their set ways and everything. Around our dining room table, I always had my one seat that I had to sit in. It was my chair. If anybody touched that chair, I would lose my shit kind of thing. And there was this one night, we're doing dinner. I'm sitting in my little seat and I start losing my mind and trying to get out of this seat. My parents are like, what the hell is wrong with you? Knock it off kind of thing. And finally, they were just like, fine, get up and leave. Go. We don't know what you're doing. Just go. And as soon as they let me up, the 1970s old chandelier just came crashing down into the seat I was sitting in. (gasps) Whoa. And my parents will forever remember that because they were just like, that was weird. That was like first red flag for them. Yeah. They're like, something's very strange. And then that same house, they still live in that house, the childhood home. But I kept telling them that there was a little girl in the house. And I could describe her perfectly. Blonde, red checker prairie dress, white apron, very classic kind of thing. And I told them this for years. And the big thing was my mom ran a daycare out of the house. And she was like, do not scare the little kids. Because I was one of the oldest. So I was like, do not scare the kids. I was like, fine. And told them that probably, I don't know, 10 years. And they refused to believe. And there was one day, there was this woman that worked with my father. He is a construction worker. And this woman had apparently gotten hit by lightning. And she suddenly could start seeing ghosts and angels. Whoa. And this woman kind of creeped out the construction workers prior to this. Because she would like to hit on them and like make not nice comments and stuff and make all the guys really uncomfortable. My dad was not a fan of her and he was going up in the elevator with her one time, just the two of them. And she just looks over at him. She's like, Oh, you have a ghost in your house. And he's like, uh, huh. okay, cool. Please don't talk to me kind of thing. (laughs) And then she suddenly goes, yeah, she's blonde. And she runs around a little prairie dress, like the red gingham kind of thing with the white apron. And my dad about died. And he's like, what do you mean? And he started like getting more information from her. And she had a name. She pictured her in front of a fireplace and everything, which was really weird because our house doesn't have a fireplace. So I'm like, that's strange. Whoa. How old's your house? It's over 100 years old. They know it got moved to a certain place, but they think turn the century at least kind of thing. Okay. But it was so funny because my dad came home, like, focused, and he made me sit down. So I'm like, oh, God, what happened? Something's going on. And he stops and he goes, I need you to tell me about your ghost. And me, being pain in the ass I was at the time, was like, no, I have told you about my ghost so many times. You told me I was making it up. I'm not telling you nothing. (laughs) And he's like, just shut the fuck up and tell me. And he got really (laughs) serious. And I was like, oh, something's going on. And so I told him again. And you just saw, like, all the color just leave his face. My father is, like, redneck from backwoods, Wisconsin, basically Canadian. Like, he is that guy. And so Mm -hmm. for him to be reacting like this was really weird. So I'm like, you have to explain why. And he told me about the lady. And I was like, ha, I told you. I freaking told you. I've been telling you for years. And then he told me about the fireplace. I'm like, well, that's weird because we don't have a fireplace. He goes, no, there's a walled up fireplace in the basement. Oh. Oh. And I was just like, I never fucking even knew that was there. After that, it was like. Okay, don't tell the littlest kids, but you can tell us stuff now when things were happening. My mom got so freaked out. She went and bought like a Ouija board and was trying to communicate without really knowing Mm -hmm. the proper ways of doing it. That's a fun reaction, though. She got freaked out, so she bought a Ouija board. (laughs) I know, right? Well, it ended up in my 14-year-old hands and me... My little brother, his best friend growing up, and then our friend that was in the daycare, but was still, like, close. We all kind of formed our own paranormal group at that time. That's when Ghost Hunters first aired on sci-fi kind of thing. So we had our own little group. We did all these weird little investigations of the house. We knew where the Ouija board was 
I shouldn't say it was given to me. I knew where it was and where to put it back (laughs) without getting in trouble kind of thing. Her name was Nettie. And just interacting with Nettie for the entire time I lived there. Like, she would do weird things growing up. Braid my hair in my sleep. Which was really freaking weird. Because there's a freaking movie. It's the remake of The Haunting. It's the one with Catherine Zeta-Jones and Owen Wilson. In that movie, there's a part where the chick is sleeping and her hair lifts up and it starts braiding from the ghost children. I had to leave. (laughs) So I was like, nope, done. I'll watch the end of this in the morning. Thank you. You're like, that's a little too close yeah, to home. Way too Holy close to shit. home. That's my first experience with ghosts, which was really fun. Totally random. That just clicked in my brain. I had a boyfriend in high school who was like, oddly enough, very super religious. And I've been practicing witchcraft since I was like 12. So I don't know how I ended up with this guy, but whatever. High school's weird. It happens. And he was in the house and I kept hearing this weird sound outside and it was somebody like practicing a flute. And I was like, that's cool. I'm like, it's like a fairy flute. It was this really cool, weird, foggy day and everything. And he's sitting there on the bed and he's like, there's no such thing as fairies or ghosts for that matter. And right then something punched the wall right by his head. It was so loud. And this was the exterior wall. It wasn't like my brother like messing around or anything. It was an exterior wall and it punched right by his head. He jumped three feet away from where he was sitting, turned and looked at me and just started screaming, I don't believe in ghosts and almost started crying. (gasps) Oh, you totally fucked with his head and his worldview. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Or you didn't, but the ghost did and the fairy did. So not the same reaction as your mom going out and grabbing the Ouija board. So what about in your adult life? What's a standout story that you have? Before I started doing the podcast or anything, I still was into haunted shit because obviously. Mm -hmm. And we have a place here in Denver called the Lumber Baron Inn. And we've heard of this place. It's a gorgeous place. And me and an old friend got to go and stay at it for a show. We know the Lumber Baron because my grandmother and my mom and uncle lived about a block away from it at one point. And why it's infamous was while my grandmother was still living there, there was a murder. It had fallen into decay and it became a flop house, basically. And there was two girls murdered in the house. They never caught who did it. They don't have an actual motive. They have, like, names. They know the girls' names. And they know one was strangled. And they think the other one walked in at the wrong time and was killed. So it's a big deal to go and stay in their room. They know which room it was, so you can actually stay in the room. And we got the room, which I was very excited about. The way the Lumber Baron handled their ghosts, they're very respectful. People could bring the girls trinkets and they had like a little altar set up to them. And they were very respectful. It's one of those, they're very careful who they talk to about it kind of thing. So I really appreciate that. They don't go for the horrible, morbid side of it. Yeah, the torture porn. Exactly. So that story was actually one of the reasons why my grandmother moved from Denver. We always knew about the Lumber Baron because of that. When that happened, my grandma went, nope, we're leaving. We're out of here. We're moving away. So it was a big deal to stay there. So we're staying there. We got the room and we kept having weird things. Like the door would open by itself randomly. It happened twice. And we're like, well, old building, people walking on the wrong boards, maybe something shifting. And then (laughs) that night, like I said, one of the girls was strangled and we're in bed. I woke up and I felt my throat completely close. I have a weird shellfish allergy. Sometimes it's there. Sometimes it's not. We don't understand it. It doesn't make sense. But I'm very careful of it. So I'm like, oh, God, I got into something wrong. I could feel like something on my throat, which was very, very freaky to wake up to. Because it was the pressure that woke me up. And I'm like, that's weird. I don't like that. It has to be allergies. My throat is closing. Tried to wake up my friend, and as soon as I reached for my friend, everything stopped. And I could breathe again. There was nothing there. And I was like, well, that was weird. Okay. So I was like, maybe it's a residual thing. Who knows? The next three days after we left the Lumber Baron, both me and my friend had something follow us home. And that was one of the weirdest things I've ever been through. My husband was gone. He was traveling. 
So it's just me in the house by myself. We had wood floors and you could hear footsteps very clear, like work boots walking down the hallways. And it's just me and the cats and the cats are reacting to these things as well. We have a little hell beast who acts like she's not afraid of anything. She would curl into me and start shaking, watching something that I couldn't see. And I'm like, that's really weird. We had a stand up shower and all the bottles on the shower were just on the top. They have never fallen off. One morning, me and the cats heard the steps come down the hallway, go into the bedroom, past the bedroom, into the bathroom, and one by one, just boop, 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 the bottles were knocked down and crashing to the bottom. So it was an asshole ghost. Yeah, it was total asshole ghost. And we're like, this is the weirdest freaking thing. And like one time I woke up to my little pendulum on the side of the wall because I was not going to talk to this guy. Fuck this guy. I was just going to ignore him until he went away. But my pendulum, I woke up to it vibrating one time. I've (laughs) never seen that either. So how did you ultimately get rid of him? Did you cleanse the house or did he just go away? He just went away. I waited because you could just feel it. Like you could feel when he was there. It was very heavy. I felt like if I tried to cleanse it, It would just piss him off more. So I was just like, "Ah, I'm just going to wait until he dissipates a little bit more. And then finally, when I woke up one morning and the house felt lighter and you could tell he wasn't there anymore, I went through with freaking mugwort, let me tell you, and just did everything. I was like, nope, not doing this anymore. It was terrifying. I went and like warded everything and I was like nothing else is getting back into this house. So you said something also followed your friend home? Yes. So she was having the same stuff happen. She was here in the work boots. Her cats were freaking out about it. She didn't have the bottles but she would hear things move and she could not figure out what it was. And it was one of those we didn't want to tell the other one initially but after the shampoo bottle incident I'm like no, I'm just going to check in and be like, hey, have you been having issues since the lumber bear? And she's like, girl, let me tell you. And it was just like, oh, my God. And she also had, she thought things go missing, just like small things. But she wasn't 100% sure. It was a lot of weird stuff like that. Yeah. I don't know if I want to stay in that room again. Do you think it was the two victims of the crime that followed you guys home? I think it was the dude. Yeah. I think it was the, the murderer. Yeah. I think his energy was still there. It said his energy is still there kind of controlling them. There's been like a few ghost shows that come up here and there. And they're all like the psychics and everything. They always say there's definitely a negative energy and he's keeping the girls hidden kind of thing. Oh, that's horrible. So not only did he kill them, but that like for eternity, they're stuck there under his thumb. Right? Oh, and it's such a sad story. But apparently it's gotten better with the current owners because they've done so much work to get the girls out more. So I guess that's a really good good thing. The woman that owns it is fabulous. You said that you stayed at this place several times. Yeah. Anything like this happen again? A little bit. Okay. Ironically, the second time I stayed with my husband this time in a different room, I had jewelry and my eyeliner go missing. And I was like, what in the absolutely I'm like tearing through things you could tell that's like the only makeup other than my lipstick I put on for you guys I'm an (laughs) eyeliner person that's what I do I know I have it I literally put it on for dinner it's not in my makeup bag it it was so weird and then my necklace I think it was my pentagram at the time went missing so that's a weird thing to have I'm just like, maybe they had house cleaning come in and something knocked it over and I went and checked and they said, no, nobody's been in the room. Several months later, the suitcase that I had everything in, I went and packed it with different clothes kind of thing and just had it ready to go for a different trip. And I opened it to put something else in it. And my pentagram and my eyeliner were perfectly set on top of all the new clothes Well, she returned it. And I was just like, close suitcase, walk away for a little bit. (laughs) On top of the new clothes that you had just put in? Yes. Oh, dear. It was so weird. And I was just like, huh, cool. Okay, that's a new one. The freaking Lumber Baron in Denver. If you guys get a chance, absolutely gorgeous, amazing, highly recommend. So when you were staying there, were you staying there just for the spooky experience or were you actually ghost hunting? Neither. For (laughs) the first time, they had what they called the Conjure Gala set up. It was like all these 
hoodoo people coming in to do stuff, which made the energy freaking insane. So I don't think that helped. Bet. And then the second time we stayed, it was for a vampire ball. Oh, fun. So that was a lot of fun. I wanted my husband to see it and experience it. I mean, hopefully not the same experience I had, but I wanted him to see it because it's really gorgeous. Are there other experiences that you've had that you want to tell us about before we talk about the most recent place? A fun one that we had, me and my buddy Rain that you guys met this weekend, Mm -hmm. who she was working the booth with me. We were up for our friend Candy's birthday party in Victor, Colorado, which is like old gold mining town kind of thing. And there's a place called the Black Monarch Hotel. The history is a little bit jumbled, but it supposedly was a saloon at one point, possible maybe brothel, which makes sense at that time in that area. My darling friend Rain is absolutely freaking terrified of ghosty stuff. Her rule when we go anywhere spooky is she has to sleep in bed with me. There's no if ands, or buds. It doesn't matter if my husband's there. It doesn't matter if her husband's there. She's in bed with me. It's the rule. We're in this bed together, and I had finally fallen asleep. And previous that day, we had friends who were telling me, Rain apparently wasn't there for this conversation, but they were telling me that they had stayed there before in their previous experiences. And they had heard a whistle, which apparently is very, very common, and knocking. Rain knew nothing of this, and we're in bed. I finally fell asleep. She hears a whistle in the hallway. And it's like three, four o'clock at this point. Everybody's passed out asleep finally. And she knows that she can't hear anything. She hears this whistle. And then all of a sudden she hears three knocks on the door. And the door she heard this on doesn't move. Like it doesn't open. Like there's the room door. And then there's like an old door that just has furniture in front of it now. But it doesn't actually open. And she heard knocks on that, she thinks. She heard that, she just noped, and she rolled into me and tried to hide and burrow in the blankets. And that's what woke me up. I'm not fully awake, and I think it's the street lights keeping her up. So I'm, like, patting her head, being like, it's okay, don't worry. And then we hear footsteps come into the room. Very cowboy boot-esque. That heel is pretty well-known. So I have to sleep with white noise. Like, I'm one of those, I will hear everything. Growing up in a haunted house, I need some noise so I can get some sleep. We put the white noise app on her phone because I left my charger cord in the car like a dork and I wasn't going to go back out. So we had it on her phone and these footsteps come in, go to her phone. We see the screen light up and the white noise turns off. And then (sighs) we hear the boots leave. And she doesn't know I'm awake. I don't know she's awake. And finally, I'm just like, um, dude, are you you awake? And she's like, oh my God, yes! (laughs) (laughs) And she's like, I don't know if I want to go check my phone. I'm like, I'm not checking your phone. She's like, well, I'm not going to do it then. (laughs) She got up and went and checked her phone in the morning. And it was just paused. It wasn't stopped. The app didn't stop. Nothing. It was still up. And everything, it was just paused. So either something had to hit the pause button or possibly this, whatever she had plugged in to use as a speaker came loose or something like that? Or did she not have any speaker? Nope. It was just plugged in like a normal charger cord. Hmm. And nobody was around it. Except the ghost who was pissed about the noise, who, by the way, he knocked and you didn't answer the door. That doesn't mean come on in. That means, okay, don't come in. They didn't answer. What a rude. (laughs) Thank you. It was just so weird. We were so confused. He was just knocking like, excuse me, could you turn down the white noise? I'm trying to haunt here. All right. I'll do it for you. Gosh. I'm going to tell her that. That'll make her feel better about it. I'm sure it will. Yeah. Same basic thing happened on the Queen Mary. We didn't hear any boot stomping or knocking, but we did get the normal white noise that normally runs on the phone all night. Only lasted about two hours and then stopped. Weird. Ghosts must hate that. And also my eyeliner disappeared. Oh! I thought I forgot to pack it. I made everybody walk all the way to the Walgreens or something (laughs) in downtown Long Beach because I was like, oh, I must have forgotten it. But I got back and it's not anywhere here. And I remember packing it. So something took it. 
There you go. Yeah. It'll be on top of the clean clothes next time you pack for another trip. Exactly. I, yeah. Okay. So next trip I take. Yeah. You hear that? <laughs> you better return it. Yeah, I'm at the point where I'm afraid if I'm staying in a haunted hotel, I'm afraid to take my jewelry off at night and put it on the nightstand. That's a good point. Because I'm afraid it won't be there. Oh, that's a yeah. very good point. I didn't think about that. But yeah, that's a risk. I was like, I don't want to lose my diamonds. Oh, God, no. I travel with a piece of iron as my necklace and nothing touches iron. So <laughs> that's true. I need to get like an iron case to put everything in. So I understand that you had some experiences on the Queen Mary. Yeah, we had a couple. I haven't gone through the evidence review, but I'm very, very excited. And we'll do a wrap up episode on my podcast toward October. Oh, cool. Excellent. Excellent. Mm-hmm. But it was really cool. Rain's pretty sure she got her hair tugged, which she was not a fan of. <laughs> we thought think we got to communicate with Jackie, the little girl in the pool area, because we started mm-hmm. having some really weird stuff happening. We heard a woman's voice twice. With your ears, not on recording. With our ears. I haven't listened to any of the recordings yet. I'm not ready. But we heard it twice. And anytime we heard it, we immediately would go to that area. Rain would or I would. And we would be watching and waiting for someone to come around the corner. And no one ever did. That was really like, huh, that was weird. And then it was also humid as hell when we were all there. It was hot. As we're sitting there by the pool at one point, I just had horrible cold spot chills, which Rain had never experienced. So she got her first (laughs) cold spots near the pool at the Queen Mary, which is usually Jackie. So I think that was really cool to be like, I took Rain to a heavy hitter for her first real ghost investigation. Not an accidental one. Yeah. So that was pretty cool. (laughs) We think we had an interaction with John Petter down in the basement by the door 13, the one that the guy gets smashed. Yeah, he got cut in half. Yeah. I don't know why I did the action because it's a (laughs) podcast. So I don't know why. That's okay. We can hear it. We can hear the clapping. (laughs) You can hear the clapping. (laughs) I I have a feeling the sounds a little bit different than that but yeah more squishy and more squishy i wasn't gonna say it but i'm really glad you did <laughs> he's supposedly a real big fan of the ladies and kind of messing with rain a little bit i was like well if you want to touch us you can and right then and there you could you know a girl knows what it feels like to have a guy behind her say at like a bar or a concert like pressed up against you we all know that feeling unfortunately yes exactly it was that and i was just like Oh, God, but cold. It was so weird. And then I actually had my jewelry on my chest move. Whoa. And I don't know if it's on film or anything. I really hope it is. But also, I just felt like my necklace roll, which didn't make any sense because it wasn't caught. It was free hanging earlier. And it just felt like a hand go like, boop. So that was really weird. The classic nice necklace move. Yeah. Uh Uh-huh. Sounds like an overall creepy dude. Yeah, so it's it's kind of interesting that we kept running into those. Oh my god, maybe I have a problem with those. I just hit that. Oh my god. With creepy dudes? Creepy dude ghosts. I think I have a thing with creepy dude ghosts. (laughs) Especially if they wear cowboy boots. Yeah. So. Oh god. (laughs) People who aren't familiar. So the Queen Mary was constructed in the 1930s and it's, it's beautiful art deco style throughout, yes. which they preserved. I think Diana counted 53 different types of wood. At least. Everything's wood. Yeah. <laughs> wow. And <laughs> there's a beautiful pool on one of the upper decks. It's closed off, but you were able to go in there during the day, Angela. Is that correct? No, the pool is completely condemned. So you can't go in at all, sadly. So we just sat outside of it like a couple of okay. dorks. That's okay. We did the same thing. <laughs> That's what we did. Yeah, I I was devastated when I found out we couldn't go in. Um, Yeah, it looks super cool. It It looks so old and creepy with the ropes hanging down. Yes. My understanding is, I know at the Biltmore House in Asheville, it's the same thing. They have all these ropes hanging down. And what I understand is a lot of people didn't know how to swim back then. So they would just like have these rope baskets that you could sit in so you could be in the water but not have to swim. I don't know if it was the same in the 30s, but Weird. Were, I saw ropes. That yeah. was before inflatable tubies. It, yeah, that's fair. Old pools creep me out. There's yeah. just something so creepy about them. Especially on the upper decks of a ship. Who's below that pool and what's going on below that pool? Thank you. 
It's I think just weird. Pools on a cruise ship is weird, anyways. Indeed, like, indeed. Yeah, it's, it's it's a little weird to yeah, me. It's surrounded by water. Why yeah. Do you... Well, you don't want to just jump off the ship and go swimming. I mean, that's not yeah. how it works when you're out at sea. No. But but still, in this case, it was a still cruise ship, so it should have been safe to go swimming. But yeah, it's condemned. And then also in the basement, the fellow that you experienced. So tell us the story about him. I know he was crushed in half, but I don't know the full story. I just know the crushing bit. So they don't (laughs) actually know. And there's a few different theories. One of the theories is he was an engineer down there working. And the guys apparently would get bored and play chicken. They're the flood doors, the buckhead doors, the yeah. bunkhead door, or something like that. And apparently it was a thing to play chicken to go through the door as quickly as possible how many times before the door shut all the way. Because they did these drills numerous times. So they were used to it. There's one theory that he was playing this game and he tripped, he fell, or he underestimated the amount of time he had and got squished. <laughs> Another theory is that he was actually murdered at the time there was this weird strike situation happening, if I remember correctly, and I'm not combining stories in my head. And there was a chance he was not union and he was held there as the doors closed by the other guys. Ooh. Was he a scab? Yeah. One of the theories is that he was a scab. Okay. Was he actually sliced in half? I guess pretty well mangled. Yeah. I would think with those doors, you basically would fall apart. He survived the whole ordeal and and was taken somewhere else and died there. Our ghost tour guy told us about that. So the Queen Mary is like Disneyland. No one dies at Disneyland. Nobody actually dies on property. That's a good point. Mm -hmm. So they're Mm -hmm. always deemed unresponsive until they can get off the property and to a hospital where they're pronounced dead. I see, I see. So it was probably one of those ruses. Exactly. Which I was like, what? Yeah, right? Wait, so even if somebody dies at Disneyland, they just declare that it didn't happen? They remove them from the property before they sign time of death. Declare them dead. Yeah. Wow, you've got some pool if you can demand that happen. (laughs) Right? Okay, so next question. (laughs) When people see this guy, do they only see like the upper half or the lower half? (laughs) So he would have been like right down the middle. Oh, down the middle. Yeah, not down like, the middle. Okay, so it's a vertical slice. I think all the stories of, are he's full again. Put, he's put together. Okay. Stitched back together. Just smooshed. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Pre smushed. Pre smushed. Pre smushed. Yeah, he probably wants to identify as a whole person <laughs> and not That's just. a good point. Yeah. A half. spot. I'm just thinking about everything that's like cut in half. Like yeah. <laughs> one ball, one foot, one ear. Nobody wants that. So he's still running around and apparently he's still pissing people off, even in the mm-hmm. afterlife, whistling and grabbing jewelry and grabbing butts and doing that stuff. Okay. There's like at least three different Johns on the ship who are like this. There's so many Johns and they're all young guys who apparently like to get frisky. And I'm like, really? Peter James, who was an old paranormal investigator, like that was the guy you saw on all the sightings and unsolved Mm -hmm. mysteries. The guy with like the white hair and the big black bushy mustache. That's always what he looked like. He was the big one that got the Queen Mary really investigated and everything. He says that he thinks there's over 600 ghosts on the Queen Mary that he believed he identified. What? And remember, because the Queen Mary also ran into a British troop transport, I think. Really? It was a troop transport. And basically cut it in half in the middle of the night and everyone died on that ship. On the ship that they ran into? Yeah, the one that they ran into. Okay, and this is during wartime yes. when they became a military ship? Yes. Okay. And that that was like the biggest thing that ever happened. I was trying to figure out why there were so many dead bodies on a cruise ship that makes sense exactly and that one was they think it was like three four hundred people on that ship alone when you go down into the propeller box there's supposed to be moans and voices down there which doesn't make any sense because it's outside the ship they Mm -hmm. think some of that might be these guys who were killed when the queen mary ran into their ship oh wow oh my god so it's like all these horrible stories diana will also include 
notes in our show notes for all of these things that you're talking about so people can go and do a little bit more research on their own and learn about these really creepy things that you saw. Yes. Did you encounter any of the moans or anything down in the propeller room, in the engine room, anything like that? We kept hearing, it sounded like something being thrown or something. It was very strange. We couldn't figure out what the hell it was. So you felt Jackie. Mm-hmm. Um, you heard a woman's voice throughout the ship that was disembodied. Mm-hmm. And then you felt the squished guy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Mr. Two halves. Mr. Two halves. <laughs> you said his name was John Petter? Petters, like P E D D E R? Like Peddler without the L. He was getting frisky. Yeah. What other weird things did you experience there? We did stay the night. The next morning, I was in the shower, and I'm pretty sure somebody walked into the bathroom. Ooh. You could just see the shadow come in and I could see like the head over the top of Ooh, the creepy. thing. And I wasn't fully awake yet even. But the head was white and it was like the old man starting to bald a little bit area. You could see that. I was like, what the hell? And I literally did that. I opened my eyes again and it was gone. Oh, shit. And I got out of the shower because don't mess with me in the shower. Like I saw Psycho too young as a kid and I've had spirits do that and we don't become friends. I get out of the shower to go find my friend. She's still in bed asleep. I had to wake her up. I'm like, you were in the bathroom, right? She's like, no? Oh, no. What? And I was like, <laughs> you want to get in the shower next, right? She's like, yeah. I'll tell you after you get out. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you why right now because I, I don't think she would have gotten in the shower. What room did you stay in just out of curiosity? We were in M128, which is not at all a famous one. Yeah, but if there's 600 ghosts on this ship. And I didn't feel anything. And that's really weird because usually you feel when somebody's watching you or you get that burst or you get that energy, something nothing whatsoever so i think it was just this weird residual bit i don't think he even knew i was there kind of thing i just think he came in looked in the mirror disappeared before we end i do want to say that diana and i purchased a seeing spirits tea from you i believe is what it was called and we did consume it. It has a uh, mugwort and wormwood in it. Yes, it does. We did drink this on the Queen Mary our last night there to see. And we went exploring to see if we could find anything. And we actually got the most activity in our rooms. We used the Estes method. And it was fun. Apparently something was really upset that Diana didn't make her bed. <laughs> it was like, kept going on and on about the sheets. On and on about what the sheets. What a scene, the sheets. Oh, yeah. yeah, I was yelling at you, right, Diana? I was yelling. Yeah. yeah. I know you have other teas and herbs and things like that as well available on your site. So anybody listening definitely should check that out at heartandhornstore.com. And then also tell people where they can find your podcast. My podcast is linked to everything on there as well. But it's myhuntedlifepodcast.com. But most of my stuff is posted on the Patreon, which is patreon.com, My Haunted Life Podcast. That's great that you have a Patreon. Everybody needs to support us through Patreon. That's yes. that's really the only way we can make any money at this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so patreon.com slash My Haunted Life Podcast. Yes. You also have some socials as well. I try to keep it simple. Everything for the podcast is My Haunted Life podcast that's facebook instagram tiktok and then heart and horn everything else and heart is spelled h-a-r-t and it comes from your last name heartshorn yeah which is so cool (laughs) you just have some beautiful stuff on there and your instagram is really beautiful too thank you i I really appreciate it love everything you're doing Angela, thank you so much for coming on today and chatting with us. It was so awesome to get to meet you face to face at Midsummer Scream. And I got to try your tea and see your products in person. I can't wait until you restock on a lot of things. You do pre-orders though, right? I do. Especially if you're at a show and you see something you want, I always tell people take pictures and email me. Well, listeners, Hainted Loves, what do you think? Do you know any frisky dead Johns that have groped you recently? How many hairstyles does the ghost in your bedroom know how to do and are you going to have a spooky day? Homespun Haints is hosted by Becky Kielimnik and Diana Doty and produced by Homespun Haints Media LLC. Editing and music by Becky Kielimnik. 
Show notes by Diana Doty. If you have a ghost story and you'd like to be considered as a guest for this podcast, please visit our website at homespunhaints.com slash submit.